I know what you're trying to do. I'm trying to free your mind, Neo. But I can only show you the door. You're the one that has to walk through it. All praise to Yahweh Elohim. What up, y'all? It's your boy Pac-Way, Kate Prince, from the Rumble Room. And today's POV, POV 5, is titled, The Messiah, Avid Follower, and Astute Teacher of the Law. Now, in the last two lessons, POV 3 and POV 4, we focused on the history of the Ancestral Oath Covenant, the various times it was renewed in our nation's family history, and also the details of its structure and how it serves as Israel Nation's Magna Carta or Constitution. In the following lesson, POV 5, we will take a look at the various passages in the Gospels that prove that the Messiah was a covenant law abiding and covenant law teaching prophet of Elohim. Yes, the Messiah did not come to dissuade Israel from following the covenant law of Elohim, but as all other prophets of Israel's past, the Messiah came to turn Israel back unto the law of Elohim. Now, before I move forward, I'd like to thank all those who support the Rumble Room channel. If you haven't already, hit the thumbs up, click the subscribe button, and the bell so you don't miss any future uploads. It's your support that makes the videos more accessible. Now, the general purpose of a POV is to offer a first-person point of view as I critically read the text, that together we can identify important scriptural concepts in the passage and view them from different angles to get a deeper understanding of what we've read. Now, the following POV, POV 5, will answer these Christian questions. Didn't Christ say he would do away with the law? Where does it say in the Bible that Christ taught the law? If Christ came to fulfill the law, doesn't that mean we no longer have to regard the law? Now, before we set out on our scriptural journey, we ought to understand the historical context of the time period that we're dealing with. Why is it important to understand historical context? There's this unspoken understanding held by the large portion of Christians that Elohim divided the timeline of humanity between an Old Testament period and a New Testament period. As if at some point Elohim, at the end of this so-called Old Testament period, closed the curtains on human life and in a great big voice announced that we've reached some intermission and that after this intermission, we could return and be seated for a New Testament period and resume the show called human history. This is the absurdity that arises in Christian thinking, particularly when Christian pastors don't educate their congregations about how and where Bible history fits in with world history. Christians, trying their best to understand, conceptualize Bible history according to the way it is formatted, by Old Testament period and New Testament period. Most Christians, when Israelites refer back to the Law and Prophets, say, none of that even matters anymore. That's Old Testament. We're in the New Testament now. But is that really a sensible and functional way to understand the Israelite scriptures? Is that the way Israelites understood or conceptualized these writings? My guess is not in the least. It was a Christian church who formatted the collection of these writings into what we call the Holy Bible composed of an Old Testament and a New Testament. Most Christians don't realize that the books of the current biblical canon don't even capture the period just before the time of the Messiah's birth. And how many Christians don't realize that the portion that did was formerly in the canon, but was taken out? So it's important to be mindful about how the Roman Catholic Church and even Protestant Christian Church has shaped our understanding of the biblical historical narrative. What I propose that we do is place the history of the Bible within the context of the world historical narrative. And so let's give that a shot right now. First, let's rewind to understand the cultural context that the Messiah was born in and lived in. The time of the Messiah's first arrival in earthly ministry falls within the context of the Roman occupation. That's right, the Fourth Kingdom. This reference to the Fourth Kingdom, that is, Rome, is derived from the image of Nebuchadnezzar's troubling dream, or more commonly referred to as Daniel's image. This image, found in Daniel chapter 2, 
represents the various kingdoms that would enslave Israel nation according to the curse of captivity in Deuteronomy 28. The image consists of four medals, each type of medal representing a distinct kingdom captivity. Daniel's interpretation of the dream found in Daniel chapter 2 verse 36 through 45 tells us that the gold head represents Nebuchadnezzar's king of Babylon. The silver arms represent the kingdom of Medo-Persia. The chest and torso of brass represent the kingdom of Greece. And the fourth kingdom, the kingdom of Rome under which Christ was born was represented by legs of iron down to the feet, which was mixed with clay. So at the time of Christ's advent, Israel had already passed through three captivities and was undergoing the fourth and last, Rome. Moreover, Israel had been anticipating liberation by the Messiah foretold of in the books of the prophets. So when we are reading the quote unquote New Testament gospels, we are reading of an Israelite people still undergoing the captivity curses of the covenant made at Horeb under the leadership of prophet Moses. The same covenant found in the books of Moses. And this ultimately brings us, as well as all Bible-believing Christians, to the inevitable and undeniable conclusion that Christ, Yahushua Mashiach, was an avid follower and astute teacher of the covenant law given to Israel at Horeb through Moses. Now Isaiah 42, 21 says, Yahweh is pleased for his righteousness sake. He will magnify the law and make it honorable. Malachi chapter three, verse one through four says, Behold, I will send my messenger and he shall prepare the way before me. And Adonai, whom ye seek, shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith Yahweh of hosts, but who may abide the day of his coming, and who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire, and like fuller's soap, and he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto Yahuwah an offering in righteousness. Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto Yahuwah, as in the days of old, as in former years. Second Chronicles 7.14 says, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray, and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. In the following segment, we'll explore scripture and see that Messiah was born and raised under covenant law instruction, learned covenant law instruction, lived covenant law instruction, and taught covenant law instruction. In POV 5, we'll see that Messiah, a prophet of Elohim, preached righteousness by the covenant law and also repentance from sins by turning back to the covenant law as all of Elohim's prophets had done before. Let's get started. So we'll start with the few passages that demonstrate Christ being born and raised by law-abiding parents, Joseph and Mary. In these verses, we can remain confident that law-abiding parents would have raised children according to how the law commanded. We'll start with one of the earlier points in Christ's ministry, Luke chapter two, 21 through 24, and we'll skip ahead to verses 39 through 40. Here we see Joseph and Mary faithfully keeping the Sinai covenant law, according to what was commanded to Abraham and to the children of Israel concerning ceremonial offerings and child circumcision. And it reads, And when eight days were accomplished for the circumcising of the child, his name was called Yahushua, which was so named of the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the days of her purification, according to the law of Moses, were accomplished, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male that openeth the womb shall be called holy to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice according to that which is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now, after meeting elders Simeon and Anna, Luke writes, 
And when they had performed all things according to the law of the Lord, they returned into Galilee to their own city, Nazareth. And the child grew and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Now, if we keep reading, we see that law abiding Joseph and Mary with young Messiah make their pilgrimage to Jerusalem for the law prescribed feast of unleavened bread. Passover. By mistake, they leave young Messiah in Jerusalem, but upon returning, they find him in the temple inquiring the scholars about the law of Elohim. We'll start at verse 46 and it reads, And it came to pass that after three days, they found him in the temple sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. Verse 49. And he said unto them, How is it that ye sought me? Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? And they understood not the saying which he spake unto them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject unto them. But his mother kept all these sayings in her heart. Verse 52. And Yahushua increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. So in these passages, we can see that after being born to covenant law abiding parents, Christ was raised by covenant law abiding parents under the Sinai covenant law and started at a very early age learning the wisdom of the Sinai covenant law. How do we know we learned the Sinai covenant law well? Well, let's take a look at the Gospel of John in chapter 7, at verses 14 through 18, where during the Feast of Tabernacles, Messiah encounters and ultimately impresses a group of Pharisees while teaching at the temple. Verse 14 reads, Now about the midst of the feast, Yahushua went up into the temple and taught. And the Jews marveled, saying, How knoweth this man letters, having never learned? Verse 16, Yahushua answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine but his that sent me. If any man do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. Verse 18. He that speaketh of himself seeketh his own glory, but he that seeketh his glory that sent him, the same is true and no unrighteousness is in him. The last passage from this segment I'd like to share is about when Christ was tempted by Hasatan in the wilderness. This wilderness test, if we call it that, can be found in Gospels Matthew, Mark, and Luke. During the wilderness test, Messiah can be seen quoting the Law and Prophets, but the particular moment I'd like to highlight for our study is the first test in Matthew chapter 4, verses 3-4, through 4, when Hasatan says to Messiah, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. A very hungry Messiah refuses and quotes Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3 in the law of Elohim. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. This covenant law reference is a mandate to Israel by Elohim to hearken unto and obey the covenant law established at Sinai. In context, Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 1 through 3 reads, all the commandments which I command thee this day shall ye observe to do, that ye may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers. And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these forty years in the wilderness to humble thee and to prove thee to know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldest keep his commandments or no. And he humbled thee, and suffered thee to hunger, and fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread only, but by every word 
that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. So during the wilderness test, we see the Messiah demonstrate what he as a young Israelite learned and knew well from the law of Elohim in Deuteronomy chapter 8 verses 1 through 3. And that is that life came by righteous conduct according to Elohim's law and death came by sin or transgression of Elohim's law. So as we can see from the passages above, Joseph and Mary were law-abiding parents who raised their son, Yahushua the Messiah, to be a law follower as well. And not only was Christ an avid follower of the law of Elohim, he also became very adept at teaching it. You see, for young Israelites like Yahushua Hamashiach, the law of Elohim taught righteousness. Let's now read how the impressive teachers sought to bring other Israelites to repentance and back to righteousness according to the law of Elohim. Now for Israelites in Christ's time and for any period in the nation's history, righteousness or righteous conduct was determined by the Sinai covenant law according to Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 25. The following passages in this segment will demonstrate that Messiah taught righteousness by the covenant law. Let's go. Luke chapter 11, around verse 14 or so, Messiah heals a mute person and is accused by some for casting out devils by the spirit of Hasatan. In verse 18, he says, If Satan be divided against himself, how shall his kingdom stand? Verse 20, But if I, with the finger of God, cast out devils, no doubt the kingdom of God is come upon you. After explaining how evil spirits come and go, a woman blesses Messiah, saying, Blessed is the womb that bare thee, and paps which thou hast sucked. And Messiah responds, Yea, rather blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. What word of God is Messiah in this Sinai Covenant Law cultural context referring to? What word of God was Israel commanded to keep? Was it not the same word that Elohim mentioned through Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 8 verses 1 through 3? Is Messiah not referring to the word of God that came to Israel through Moses at Mount Sinai? In the Gospel of John chapter 5 verses 46 through 47, after the healing at the pool of Bethesda, the accusing Yahudim confront Messiah in the temple and seek to kill him. And Messiah responds, for had ye believed Moses, ye would have believed me, for he wrote of me. But if ye believe not his writings, how shall ye believe my words? These passages demonstrate that the teachings of Christ and Moses are in one accord. After all, aren't they messengers from the same source? Are they not prophets of the same Elohim? Christ, as did Moses, taught the covenant law of Elohim given to Israel at Mount Sinai. Matthew chapter 5, Sermon on the Mount, Messiah is preaching to a multitude of Israelites. After preaching the Beatitudes, he encourages them, calling them the salt of the earth and the light of the world. He says, A city on a hill cannot be hid, neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. In verse 16, he says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So here we have the Messiah spurring Roman captive Israelites to demonstrate good works to glorify the heavenly Father. Now the question is, what standard of good works is the Messiah referring to? What standard of good works or good behavior conduct had Israel been given? Was it not Elohim's law given through Moses at Mount Sinai? Messiah then assures Israel that he had not come to abolish the law, but keep and observe it, just as every Israelite was commanded to at Horeb Sinai. He underscores this point essentially by saying heaven and earth would have to pass away before anything would be taken from Elohim's law. Verse 17 reads, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. 
I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Verse 18. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Then Messiah, summing up his point, says, Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So Messiah tells the multitude of Israelites that those who teach forsaking the covenant law commandments are condemned as lowest in the kingdom. And those who preach keeping the covenant law commandments, as he astutely did, will be exalted as great in the kingdom. Now, in the midst of dispute with Christians, they typically rush the conversation ahead to verse 20. For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter the kingdom of heaven. It's here that the Christian will ask, can you exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees? But Christians seem to conveniently forget that Messiah in Matthew 23, as well as other places, condemned the Pharisees as hypocrites, even saying, the scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. But do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. They bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. So when Christ assures the multitude that they will be condemned unless they act more righteously according to the law than the Pharisees, was he wrong? Christ, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 20, tells his Israelite listeners that unless they keep the Sinai covenant law and abstain from the hypocrisy of the Pharisees, then they would not enter the kingdom of heaven. And was this not the rich young ruler's problem in Matthew chapter 19, verses 16 through 26? The rich young man who found it impossible to part with his material possessions? In verse 16, he asked Messiah, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? A Sinai covenant law teaching Messiah responds, If thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. And was his response not the same to the lawyer who asked the same question in Luke chapter 10 verses 25 through 28? In Matthew chapter 7, verses 15 through 23, the Messiah warns about discerning between righteous prophets and false prophets by judging between good fruit and evil fruit, which only begs the question, what moral standard given to Israel determines between good and evil? He then says in verse 21, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but... He that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils? And in thy name done many wonderful works? And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Now in this passage, Christ distinguishes between two types of people who receive two different outcomes those that doeth the will of the heavenly father and those that work iniquity. Those who do the will of the heavenly father are granted the kingdom of heaven and the workers of iniquity are condemned. Now, what has been the will of the heavenly father since the days of the Exodus and Mount Sinai? Was there not also a price for the iniquity workers who willfully forsook the will of the Father? Was the will of the Father not that which was established at Mount Horeb, Sinai? The Messiah indeed teaches the Roman captive Israelite multitude to righteously keep the covenant law made at Horeb, Sinai. Now for Israelites in Christ's time, and for any period in the nation's history, 
The Sinai Covenant Law commands Israel to teach the law of Elohim one to another, according to Deuteronomy chapter 6, 1 through 7. The following passages in this segment will show Messiah actually teaching the law that was given at Sinai through Moses. Let's dive in. Okay, first passage, Gospel of Matthew, 22nd chapter, verses 34 through 40. Yahushua Messiah is at Jerusalem teaching in the temple. The Sadducees craftily tested him but were put to silence. Then the Pharisees decided they would try their hand. Verse 35, and it reads, Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Yahushua said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and prophets. So here we see the Pharisees inquire Messiah about the most important commandment in the Sinai covenant law. And Messiah cites not only the first, but also the second most important commandment in the Sinai covenant law. The first found in Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 5 and the second in Leviticus chapter 19 verses 17 through 18. So here in Matthew chapter 22, verses 34 through 40, Messiah once again teaches from the covenant law and prophets, just as he did during the Sermon on the Mount confirmed in Matthew chapter 7, verse 12. In the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verses 44, a leper begs Messiah to heal him. Moved with compassion, Messiah does so and sends him away, commanding him, saying, See thou say nothing to any man. But go thy way, show thyself to the priest, and offer for thy cleansing those things which Moses commanded for a testimony unto them. So here in Mark 144, we see Christ mandating obedience to what was required by the covenant law concerning a purification offering found in Leviticus 14. And that's not all. In Matthew chapter 5, verses 23 through 24, we see Messiah encouraging proper sacrifice offering at the altar. In Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 through 4, we see Messiah teaching proper almsgiving, almsgiving being a command in the covenant law in Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 28. And in Mark chapter 12, verses 41 through 44, we see him give good judgment and endorsement to a poor widow's covenant law sacrifice to the temple treasury. Lastly, in Matthew 28, verses 19 through 20, we see Christ commission his disciples to go out and teach the world what he taught them. And did he not teach them righteousness and repentance according to the covenant law of Elohim? So the next time you're in dispute with the Christian about the ministry of Messiah, show them these passages and ask them where these teachings of Christ come from. The honest Christian should answer, the covenant law given to Israel through Moses at Mount Sinai. The following verses from the Law and Prophets define what repentance is for Israel. And repentance for Israel is defined by turning away from wickedness, that is, transgression of the law of Elohim, back to obedience to the law of Elohim. In this segment, we'll look at various passages in the Gospels that demonstrate Messiah preaching repentance back into the covenant law of Elohim established at Mount Sinai. Let's dive in. The following narrative can be found in either Matthew chapter 4 or Mark chapter 1. And what we see in these two passages are a spiritually charged Messiah fresh out of fasting in the wilderness and being tested by Hasatan. Messiah passes into Zebulon and Naphtali and preaches repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In the Sinai Covenant Law context, pre-crucifixion, what ought we to presume the word repent to mean? Is it not that which is stated in the Covenant Law and Prophets? Does it not mean repentance back unto the Sinai Covenant Law established at Mount Horeb through Moses? Our next example of a Sinai Covenant Law teaching Messiah takes place at a gathering held by newly recruited disciple Levi, better known as Matthew. In Luke chapter 5, also Matthew chapter 9 and Mark chapter 2, the tax collector turned disciple, Matthew, 
throws a party for Messiah and invites all his tax collector friends and much to the chagrin of the Pharisees, Messiah was present. Seeing him at the party, they asked, why do ye eat and drink with publicans and sinners? To which Messiah responds, they that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So knowing that the righteous are law-abiding Israelites, Messiah stipulates that he did not come to call them to repentance, but for the sinners who were transgressing the covenant law of Elohim, including the publicans who collected taxes for their captors, the oppressive Roman Empire. These sinners, or covenant law transgressors, Christ tells the Pharisees are those he came to bid to repentance. Repentance to what? Was it not repentance back unto the Sinai covenant law established at Mount Horeb through Moses? It would seem that the writings on the wall say so. Our last passage in the segment brings us to Luke chapter 13 verses 1 through 5, where Messiah and his disciples are having dinner with Pharisees. It's brought to Messiah's awareness that the Roman governor of Judea, Pontius Pilate, had mixed the blood of Galileans with their sacrifices. But then Messiah warns of a similar fate if they do not repent. He says, Suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans because they suffered such things. I tell you nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Or those 18 upon whom the Tower of Siloam fell and slew them. Think ye that they were sinners above all men that dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. So what does Messiah in a Sinai covenant law cultural context dining with Pharisees mean by repent? What ought we to suppose that the Pharisees thought he meant? Do not all signs point to repent, meaning turning back unto the covenant law of Elohim made at Mount Sinai? As stated previously, and as the passages demonstrate, Christ preached repentance back unto the Sinai covenant law given to Israel through Moses. So let's review our Christian questions. Didn't Christ say he would do away with the law? No. No, Christ does not ever say he would ever do away with the law. On the contrary, Christ said he came to keep the law. Where does it say in the Bible that Christ taught the law? Here they are. Right here. If Christ came to fulfill the law, Doesn't that mean we no longer have to regard the law? Christians will often say that Christ came to fulfill the law of Elohim in our stead so that no one else will have to carry the responsibility of fulfilling the covenant law. But the truth is, Christ, as all other Israelites, was charged with the responsibility of fulfilling the law. And part of Israelite fulfillment of the law is each generation teaching the covenant law to their children. In other words, the law, by its cultural mandate of generational teaching and learning, ensures its eternality, that it will endure forever. The truth is, we must always regard the covenant law as Deuteronomy 6 commands. And as touching matters of Christ in law fulfillment, unless Christ had taught the law as was required of each Israelite, he would not be fulfilling the entire law as Christians insist that he did. To believe Christ fulfilled the covenant law, yet did not teach the covenant law, and even that the law would end, is a contradiction. So if a Christian believes and insists that Christ fulfilled the covenant law of Elohim, then they must concede the reality that Christ also taught others to follow the covenant law of Elohim. That is the only logical conclusion. And would this not make sense 
seeing as how Christ preached repentance and righteousness in a cultural context of Roman captivity, even before his crucifixion, Christ never preached that the covenant law would be done away with. Rather, he preached repentance and righteous conduct according to the Sinai covenant law given to Israel through Moses. In John chapter 7, 16, Christ teaches at the temple and the Pharisees marvel at his knowledge of the law. And he says, my doctrine is not my own, but his that sent me. John chapter 5, verses 30 through 32 tells us Christ does nothing apart from the will of the Father. Doesn't that mean Christ does nothing outside of the covenant law of Elohim? Lastly, in John chapter 10, verse 30, Christ tells us, I and my Father are one. Now, does this not suggest that the Son is always in solidarity and unity with the testimony of the Father? The testimony of the Father being the covenant law of Elohim and the writings of his prophets? Now, if a Christian can read these three verses and still deny that Christ taught the covenant law of Elohim, then the issue at hand may have less to do with doctrine and more to do with the Christian commitment to dishonesty. And if Christ indeed taught the covenant law of Elohim, the will of the Father, then he never would have willed that one should disregard following the covenant law of Elohim. In conclusion to this POV, POV 5, we've made an extensive review of the Gospels of Yahushua Hamashiach's ministry and have seen that Messiah was born and raised under covenant law instruction, learned covenant law instruction, lived covenant law instruction, and taught covenant law instruction. The Messiah, avid follower and astute teacher of the law. If you should have any questions or thoughts, please leave in the comment section below. Also, don't forget to like the video and share. Besides that, I hope this video has been edifying. Until next time, peace, light, and shalom. I know what you're trying to do. I'm trying to free your mind, Neo. But I can only show you the door. You're the one that has to walk through it.